Craven Cottage, home of Fulham Football Club. To date, their greatest achievement is reaching the final of the Europa League in 2010 when they were narrowly defeated 2-1 by Atletico Madrid after extra time. The club has produced some outstanding players. England international Bedford Jezzard played over 300 games for Fulham as a striker during the 1940s and 1950s, scoring 154 goals. He holds the club's post-war record for league goals in a season, 38 in 1953-4. Fullback George Cohen played 459 games for the club and was in England's World Cup winning team in 1966. But Johnny Haynes is arguably Fulham's greatest ever player. He holds the club appearance record of 658 games. An inside forward renowned for his exceptional passing skill, he scored 158 goals between 1952 and 1970. Haynes played 56 times for England, 22 as captain. He was the first player to be paid £100 a week back in 1961. The story of Fulham Football Club starts here at St Andrew's Church. It was a magnet for sports-minded clergymen. No fewer than eight had some involvement with the club in its first 20 years. We're going to meet two of them. The first is the club's founder, the Reverend John Henry Cardwell. We don't tend to make an automatic connection between professional football clubs and Cambridge University, but the founder of Fulham Football Club was a student here at Gomble and Keys College. Cardwell was born on a farm near Sheffield in 1842, but while he was still a boy, his father decided to give up life as a farmer, move the family to Burnley, and start a business as a coal proprietor. John attended Burnley Grammar School and was obviously a very bright boy. He was admitted here in 1861. On graduation, he felt called to the Anglican ministry, and in 1865, he was duly ordained. His calling took him to London, where he eventually set up a mission in Fulham, a district on the north bank of the River Thames. By 1874, because of the huge influx of labourers to the area, the mission had grown to such an extent that it became the parish of Fulham Fields with Cardwell, the first vicar. It was a tough parish with acute problems of poverty, overcrowding and drink. He did all he could to help. He particularly had a heart for young people and set up many organisations for them in the church. He also provided free meals for the poorest children in the neighbourhood. Cardwell wanted to do more for the youths of the church, especially those who attended the Sunday school here. And with this in mind, he approached Tom Norman, one of the Sunday school boys, with the idea of forming a cricket and football club. Norman responded enthusiastically, started to recruit players, and so the St Andrews Cricket and Football Club was born sometime, we believe, in 1879. Cardwell and Dr Patrick Murdoch, one of the church wardens, showed their support by becoming patrons. The first pitch was actually right next to the Sunday school, and it was an area of rough land, which was so bad it was simply known as the mud pond. But by 1883, the boys had begun to take the game more seriously. And instead of just playing impromptu games among themselves, looked for a proper pitch where they could have organized games. Two years later, they were good enough to actually merit match reports in the local press. A new curate was appointed at St Andrews, who immediately added status to sport at the church. His name was Peregrine Propert, and he was one of the top oarsmen of his generation. He came to assist here at St Augustine's, a mission opened by St Andrews. Shortly after his arrival, he became actively involved with the St Andrews Cricket and Football Club. He was a remarkable young man who made his mark in spectacular ways. Let's find out more about him. Propert was born in this house in 1861 in St David's, Pembrokeshire. It's Britain's smallest city. The cathedral here is the final resting place of St David, the patron saint of Wales. 
Propert was baptized and confirmed in the cathedral, and his father was the organist. His father was a very, very educated man. He had degrees from both Oxford and Cambridge, and he homeschooled Propert in the house in which he was born. As a teenager, like all teenagers, Propert wanted excitement. But for him, excitement meant danger, and he went out of his way to find it. Growing up so close to the Pembrokeshire coast, he became an exceptionally strong rower and swimmer. And at the age of 17, he offered his services to the St. David's lifeboat station. He found it thrilling to row out in a crew of 10 and save lives in the most dangerous seas. He also loved rock climbing, and he frequently used to row out across to Ramsey Island, where he would scale 400 foot vertical cliffs. For all the excitement and adventure that he found, there's one thing he just had to do. He wanted to be the first person to swim across to Ramsey Island, across the one mile treacherous Ramsey Sound. Because of its cross currents, it was deemed impossible to swim. But he did it at the age of 17 and it took 56 years before anyone else could repeat that, despite numerous attempts to do so. In 1881, Propert came here to Trinity Hall in the University of Cambridge with the intention of becoming a lawyer. He threw himself wholeheartedly into the social life of the college and the university. In fact, he was one of the founders of the Footlights Amateur Dramatic Society, which was the springboard for the careers of such famous people as Sir David Frost, John Cleese, Emma Thompson. But his particular passion was sport. He was an all-rounder. He represented Trinity Hall at football. He was a keen cricketer, but above all, he made his mark as an oarsman. He became captain of the Trinity Hall Boat Club and his crew became the best in the entire university. Propert came to Cambridge with definite career plans in mind, but while he was here, his thinking was turned upside down. Three students of Trinity College, which is where we are at the moment, played a big part in this. Propert writes about those days in the following way. My earliest intention was to take up law and politics, but fortunately, at Cambridge, I met a group of men who, although the leading athletes at the university, were also men of deep religious convictions. My association with them changed my outlook upon life. I felt there was something better to aim at than worldly success, and that was the service of God and my fellow men. The group that made such an impact on him have become known in history as the Cambridge Seven. These devout young Christian men caused a sensation in 1885 when they gave up fame and fortune to become missionaries in China. One of them was Charles Studd, a household name as one of England's foremost cricketers. As well as an England regular, he was also captain of Cambridge University. In January 1884, Studd heard the renowned American evangelist Dwight Moody speaking in London. As a result, his life was transformed. He wrote the following. Formerly, I had as much love for cricket as any man could have. But when the Lord Jesus came into my heart, I found that I had something infinitely better than cricket. As a result of meeting these men and hearing things like this, Propert left Cambridge a convinced Christian. This restless thrill seeker had finally found heart's rest in a personal relationship with Jesus. He now, more than anything else, wanted to serve the poor in a deprived area. And it was here at St. Augustine's mission in Fulham that he found his life's vocation. Not long after his arrival, he befriended some youths who worked in a local cab yard. These youths were looked down upon by respectable people as being hooligans. 
Propert opened a gymnasium for them here at the mission. Looking back on those days, many years later, he wrote the following words. Among them I worked and made some of my best friends. At this time I was rowing for the Thames Rowing Club First Eight, and when I brought home silver trophies and cups, it produced great excitement and admiration. Proper, in fact, twice won the Grand Challenge Cup of the Henley Royal Regatta, which was quite an achievement in the world of rowing. My association with these young fellows produced much criticism from the respectable, some of whom went so far as to say I was not fit to be a clergyman and reported me to the bishop, Dr. Temple. I explained to Dr. Temple that I'd come not merely to preach, but to apply Christian principles as far as I could in Lily Road. I believe I convinced the good bishop that my critics did not really understand the gospel message. And here Propert quotes the words of Jesus. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I think even now the church has largely forgotten this truth. We are terribly respectable. Propert served St. Augustine's faithfully until his death at the age of 78. In the 1950 history of Fulham Football Club, tribute was paid to him for the incredible contribution he made to the club in its early years of its existence. With men like Propert, Cardwell and Murdoch behind the club, it made rapid progress. In 1887, the first trophy was won, the West London Association Cup. That same year, the club changed its name to Fulham St Andrews Football Club to avoid confusion with other clubs called St Andrews. In January 1889, the name was shortened to Fulham Football Club. However, this did not represent a break with the church because Cardwell remained president and Dr Murdoch continued as a member of the committee. In 1894, the club started to look for a permanent home and found a derelict site here on the north bank of the Thames, where once stood a grand house owned by Lord Craven. It was called Craven Cottage. Now that's something of an understatement when you consider it was an impressive building with a large estate. After two years hard work, the ground was finally ready and the name Craven Cottage was adopted. Now many people think the ground is named after this building in the corner of the stadium, but they're wrong. It's actually the creation of an architect who thought it would be fun to build it on the site of the original Craven Cottage. It's always been used for the players' changing rooms. The man who set the ball rolling and made it all possible the Reverend John Henry Cardwell, was president until 1890, when he left St Andrews to become rector of St Anne's in Soho, a very tough parish. When he died in 1921, at the age of 78, the Church Times paid the following tribute to him. Though ever a fighter for truth and right, he had the gift of being able to fight without bitterness and without losing friends. No priest in the London diocese was more universally beloved. And certainly, supporters of Fulham Football Club have every reason to remember his name with gratitude. Mm -hmm.